Hi, I'm John Ceruto and welcome to this HTTV special. My guest is a Pulitzer Prize finalist, author, former award-winning investigative reporter and columnist. But more importantly, he is an individual who understands this state's culture, history, and personality. His name is Mark Diano. Mark, welcome. John, thanks for having me. Love, love have coming you. in. Mark, I miss reading your column. I know the investigative work that you did all those years for the Star-Ledger was award-winning, and more importantly, I think it connected with the, the readers of the paper and the people of New Jersey. What are you doing today? Well, I miss it too, and uh, <clears throat> I think, to your point, I think one of my strengths as a, as a columnist and one of the reasons I ended up with the following I had was because I'm like a typical Jersey guy, you know? I didn't move in from somewhere else. You know, I don't live in a Jersey City brownstone and, you know, go to fancy restaurants. Uh, you know, I'm a typical Jersey guy. So, um, and I think that voice is, is really, that those kind of authentic voices are, have, have left journalism. In fact, I was having a conversation with my old editor, Jim Wilsey, just the other day. And, you know, Pete Hamill died. Uh, a guy named Jim Dwyer from uh, Newsday and the New York Daily News has died. Jimmy Breslin. Jimmy Breslin. I'm still alive, but he said to me, you know, the people like you, that guys like you that actually go out and talk to people, there's just none left. You know, that, that print, the print industry has lost that. And, and, and uh, the digital age, the digital industry is it's, it's all about them you know i went here and i did this and i saw this and i saw that and and you know social media is so egocentric that uh i think the kind of reporting that i did where you actually go out and talk to people and you see value in their stories the values in their story my story doesn't change you know <laughs> the values in their story um that that's been kind of lost because of the egocentricity of, of social media. But anyway, to answer your question, <laughs> I'm now the uh, press secretary for Mayor Raz Baraka in Newark. And um, it's a good job, I like it. I love, I love the city. I, I worked in the city as a journalist since 1992. Seen a lot of changes. I've defended the city as a columnist because it is there's no city in America, John, I think, that's the biggest city in a state that is as reviled as Newark. And it's, it's actually, you know, really race-based. Race um, and, um, and I think a lot of people in the suburbs don't really get there enough to appreciate it. And there's so much to appreciate about the city. And I blame the media for that because they focus on the negativity all the time. You know, they do. They focus on the murders. They focus on this. But when you, last year, we had the least amount of homis, homicides since 1961. And nobody talks about that. No, nobody hears about that. But, you know, yeah. you bring up a good point, though, Mark. You know, you, you talk about journalism today versus the person like yourself. I had boots on the ground. You would interface with the subject and really come back with for the most part, with very fair and objective reporting. What is happening to journalism? What can we believe with what we read? Narratives get put out there. Are they, is the, the motive behind that narrative today is just not trustworthy? Well, I'll tell you, I think that you have to look at it like this, and, uh, and this is what I used to teach my kids in journalism. And it's kind of, it's kind of bore itself out in the last two elections. The people you see on television whether they are the commentators or the, their guests, they're on the fringes, you know? They're at the strident end of the spectrum. They're all the way over there. Now, I would say maybe 85 to 90% of us want the same things. You know, we, we all want the same things. We want basic human needs. You know, we want jobs, we want education, we want good health care, we want all those things, right? The, the question is how to get those things, right? So the partisanship, you know, tears at the, tears at the method rather than explores the similarity. So they exploit the differences between us rather than explore 
our similarities. And to me, this is very interesting because when you have that kind of polarization, in the past, I felt like, oh, you know, we still connect with each other in, in, in a very human way. But when that polarization becomes sort of how you are expected to behave, because that's what you're being told we are from the media, now it's affected friendships and things like that that we've talked about, right? So to me, that, that's, you know, that's, you know, again, the, the tail wagging the dog. And, and I'm hoping that in, this, in the next few years, we can uh, step back from some of that and really begin to, you know, cool off some of the rhetoric and, and some, of the, some of the anger and the hatred. Because um, if we don't, we're like, we're finished. We're, we're really going to come apart, you know. <laughs> Well, let me ask you this, okay, in today's print business, for example, which is diminishing, as you and I know, and it's more electronic than it is in print, but I'm still a print guy. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a columnist. I'm working for a certain pr paper. Do I have an obligation to take a position that that paper, the owners, the editors want to put out there, or do I have the independence to write what I want? And would I keep my job if I right. write with my independent mind? Well, I tell you the truth. Uh, I always felt independent until my last year at the Ledger, and then a couple of things happened uh, with an, my new a new editor that I had. He began to edit my columns and push me in a direction that, uh, and, and the headlines too that they would put on him, which were just idiotic. Um, he began to push push my work into a direction that fit his narrative and so I was forbidden to do a column on the Kavanaugh hearings um, in the in in Newark uh, with, the, with the water crisis I was trying to write a column that was fair to the city and what the city had done and he would not run the column because it said it undermined their other reporting which was all negative and that was the only column that I ever had spiked. And so that was when I realized, I got to get out of here. Like, because these guys don't understand, they don't understand the business. You know, they don't understand the business. They don't understand what we are supposed to do as, as, a, as an organization, a, as a news entity. And, and they don't know what they don't know. You know that, and that's the, <laughs> that's the bottom line. And so I never felt any pressure about what I was writing or my opinion, as long as I could, you know, wasn't sociopathic or, you know, reckless, and it was balanced. It was what you did. And I never felt that up until my last year. And that's why I left. I mean, I left for ethical reasons. Unfortunately, it seems like that's more of the norm today yeah. With, yeah. with many, many media outlets, Mark. Mark, you know, you're an author, okay? And we talked about the last book you put out, Gods of Wood and Stone, Two Lives That Converge, and we're not going to really get into the specific story of the book. It was a fabulous read, thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, but I want to ask you about writing, because so many people are writers today. I mean, this morning I was watching a, uh, the weather, and the weather lady was talking about a book she's coming out with in March about inspirational stories, which is wonderful. But, you know, the person on the other end of that talked about a cooking book that he's putting out, and right. he's, he's a news anchor. Um, is writing a book that easy? Well, I think that what, one of the things that's happening now in the publishing industry is they begin to look at uh, your social media following and say, oh, well, this newswoman, this, uh, this, this anchor has, uh, you know, 250,000 uh, followers on his Twitter feed and Instagram. Let's do a book. Well, it's a lot. There's no commitment in following somebody online or you know putting it in a thumb up but going to the store and dropping 1995 is a commitment so i think publishing sort of falls back into this like well let's let's have a name recognition let's do let's have a celebrity have celebrity write books you know celebrity is the the the, the sense of celebrity is really taking over the country i mean you know, in, in so many ways. And that's what that book's really about. It's about, uh, you know, part of that book is about the alienation of celebrity. You know, the ball player in the book, you know, he, he achieves everything he wants to professionally, but 
personally has a lot of questions about who he is and why the people around him are they there for him or are they there are they there for who he is or for what he is right and so i think in publishing today you know you know they they do fall back on that idea that well if somebody has name recognition they're going to sell a book and you know it's for for authors like me that are trying to write you know um what I consider, you know, significantly uh, deep literary fiction, that's kind of an uphill battle, you know, because uh, the resources are going towards these other, these other things. And if, uh, you know, Steve Martin writes a novel, they're going to publish that, you know, and because people are going to buy it, you know. And, and so, you know, it's like anything else, though. It's it's a cultural, it it's the cultural trend that we are in, you know. And we either decide to swim upstream or we go downstream or try to go side to side. And you make those choices. And in my life, I've kind of always chosen to go upstream. <laughs> you right. know? Well, you have. You've gone upstream, <laughs> but you've accomplished a lot, Mark Diano, going upstream. Let's talk a little bit about you know, being an investigative columnist or just a columnist in general as a journalist who can convert can convert a situation over. Talk about one or two of the columns that you feel that you put out that really made a change, really made a change in New Jersey, in, in, in a neighborhood, mm -hmm. in people's lives, whether it was an inner city story, whether it was overcoming an illness for somebody. Is there one or two that really stuck out? Yeah, I think, I think my work on Hurricane Sandy was important. I think that uh, once the uh, storm porn was over, you know, all the pictures were over and the misery, you know, uh, we got to, uh, you know, we, we got to experience the misery of other people uh, for our entertainment, you know, like, the, you know, the TV and the photographs. Once, uh, once the misery uh, sort of abated in that, in that uh, more, dr in that dramatic fashion, um, you know, I stuck with it and I, and I saw what was going on, you know, and how these people were struggling to get back, how uh, the, there was no, um, the, 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 the state and federal plans to help them were, were, were you know, had mutated from, because, because Katrina was such a ripoff and FEMA was just, you know, exploited to such an extent then they clamped down during Sandy. And, and the very first day I had an inkling of that was really right after the storm where a woman told me that their insurance company told them that the foundation didn't crack because of the flood. It cracked because of the soil, the soil change because of the flood. So therefore it's not, it wasn't, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't covered. You know, the soil shift is what cracked the foundation, not the flood. It's the soil shift caused by the flood. <laughs> so you're not covered. And so I began to write some stories about the insurance, you know, three card Monty, and then people not being able to get their money, uh, and, you know, phony contractors. And I think it did help. I think people, you know, first of all, the individual uh, homeowners who were featured in the columns felt like somebody was getting their story out there. And then I also think that at the state level, people started to say, you know, peop you know, this guy and, if, and others are, you know, they're paying attention to what we're doing, so let's try to get things go kind of back on track. And I think the other story that I followed for a long time that I think was um, shaped me and also uh, shaped me in my journalism and also was very beneficial to the subjects was uh, the, 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 the triple, uh, triple homicide of those college kids down in Newark. And I stuck with that, like from the day that those kids were shot to the very end of the trial. Now, Mark, they were three Delaware State students, Delaware if I'm not State mistaken. Students. One survived, and that poor girl had to, uh, they separated out the trial, so she had to testify like five times. Gang related, they were innocent victims. Yeah, of uh, like an MS-13 gang thing, right? But I, I think that that 
the relationship I developed with those families and covering those stories and giving those people, uh, you know, um, an ability to tell to, to, you know, the families of these victims are, are just forgotten, you know, um, not by this, not by the state. In fact, the, the Essex County Prosecutor's Office does a tremendous job with the families, but they fall out of the media. Nobody ever follows up with them. Nobody ever seems to be invested and care about them. And uh, and I think that I did that. Um, that was important to me, you know, and, and and it shaped it shaped how I looked at subjects from then on. You know, like there was a great inv I had a great investment with that family, and from that case, um, I sort of did the same thing with the um, with the with the Brendan Tevlin case. Uh, that that. That kid we had a was, Livingston with Seton Hall yeah, prep. The kid that was just in the wrong place at the wrong time and the bizarre murder and 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 you know getting that story out, getting getting the bizarrety out there, uh, defending the kid. He was first. It was first reported by the cops that he was targeted, which targeted means like, well, he's got some relationship. He's Im, Im, he's implicated somehow, and getting that out and fighting fighting the authorities on that. Like, no, that you're, you're misapplying the word here for some other purpose. And, um, and so I think that, that that kind of stuff was, was really rewarding to me. And I think it did, you know, for our readership anyway, it, it just humanized the people that were behind these stories. You know? And I think that, that to me is what journalism should really do. It should humanize our condition. It's an interesting thing about COVID, uh, John, because, because COVID has been, the people are dying in isolation. And so we're reporting these numbers, all these numbers, we're reporting these numbers, but we're really seeing very little of the suffering, you know, because we can't witness it. You know, we, we can hear about it, but nobody's in the room. To a point where, uh, at the last go round, uh, I heard that in some of the hospitals, the nurses could only go in every six hours. Mm -hmm. So when the person is actually expiring, they are alone. You know, and that's a heartbreaking element of it. But it's it's almost like we've been conditioned to just look at the numbers. It's true. Yeah, it's true. And what we don't look at, and you and I talked about this before, Mark, is how many people because of COVID, especially the elderly who've been in isolation, they may be healthy and you're protecting them, but the repercussions of that isolation are almost as devastating as the disease itself. I agree with that. I think they are. And I think that, you know, um, one of the arguments about, you know, uh, shutting down or not shutting down has been, what are the other implications of alcoholism, domestic violence, depression, you know, all these other things, these social things. Well, you. You have to be alive to experience those things, right? So, you know, there's got to be a balance, right? So, okay. It's true. You know what, you know, you were talking before, and I, I was just reflecting, and, you know, maybe you can just share with the viewer. I mean, we all know what deadlines are like in life, and sometimes we respond well. But, you know, I may have a deadline once every two months that has to put something out at that moment. But you lived a life of deadlines. What's it like to live under that pressure and to be able to put out a quality piece of work still? You know, I mean, is it a nonstop thought process? Is it? Well, I'll tell you the truth. Um, work expands to the time allotted to it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right? So I've written great columns in a half an hour in my car. In fact, uh, when I was a Pulitzer finalist, um, many of those columns, the, 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 some of those columns uh, dealing with the hurricane, were written in a Wawa parking lot uh, with a pretzel and a Diet Coke uh, on a laptop and then trying to find some place to send it from uh, under great duress, right? But then if I have time, if I had time to write a column, like the column was due on <laughs> Wednesday and it was Monday, I would, you know, you know. <laughs> Wait until Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> so I was always better under pressure. And I think that a lot of that, it just has to do uh, with, you know, being an adrenaline addict, you know, I mean, uh, to be honest with you, I think that that's really what I, I'm driven by that. I like the frenetic energy. All I right. live my life like that. I drive like that. <laughs> I, I uh, you know, I, 
I don't waste time in a day. Well, you have know. six kids. Yeah, I do have raising six, kids. six children. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure you're under that adrenaline all the time. Yes, Mark Diano, you know, you were raised here in Summit. You went through the Summit school system. Did you always want to be in journalism? Where, where, did, the, where did that inspiration come from? You know, it's funny because um, I did. Um, I had a teacher in, in uh, Summit High named uh, Mr. Holman uh, who recognized that I, I had some writing talent. And, um, and I was always curious about things. Uh, and, and I remember, I remember uh, very distinctly some tragedies that happened here. And I read about them in the paper. And then I would go to school the next day. This was just like grammar school. And I would know the details <laughs> of what happened and the kids, other kids wouldn't, right? Um, and they were both, you know, the two, the two things that stuck out were, were tragic. Uh, you know, they were tragedies um, of kids that were around our age. And so that idea of like uh, having information that other people didn't have, a sort of being on the inside of things, to know things, that, to tell people things, that, to, to enlighten them to things, was attractive to me. And then when I, when I this teacher kind of, um, this teacher kind of encouraged me to take up my, be more serious about my writing, I, I did. And um, I always wanted to be a novelist uh, because I thought it was an easy job, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and I would read it and think, I could do this, right? And my father said to me, you know, if you want to have a advocation, you have to have a vocation that, that aligns to it, right? And that's coming from an educator, correct? Yeah, right. Your dad so, was a teacher. So the vocation would be would be, you know, becoming a journalist, and then the advocation would be, you know, writing novels off of those experiences and polishing my writing as I went along. Well, the plan was to, you know, spend a couple of years in the newspaper business and then, um, you know, start to write the books. And actually, you know, between the six kids and two divorces and the, the, the pace of journalism, especially when I was a sports writer, um, it, it didn't quite work out like that. But, you know, I did, I published three other, you know, nonfiction books. And, you know, when I published my first novel at 55, you know, I thought, you know, it took a long time, but I, I got there. And that, that's, I'm proud of that. Oh, of course, tremendous yeah. accomplishment. And here's your second novel. And I know you're working on a third. Yeah. You know, Mark, we're going to do a two-part today, which is going to be great. But, you know, while we were just talking a little bit about Summit, you know, there were some people that really influenced your life. I know that you and I share a little bit of a background together in the, in the, in the wrestling community, but I, I know you wrote a beautiful column on a former coach of yours yeah. growing up, Norm, yeah. Norm, Norm Buick. Norm yeah. Buick, who was a wonderful man. Tell what type of lessons did Norm instill in you? You know, Norm was great uh, because he, he was the uh, old school kind of, uh, what do they call it, catch as can wrestling, catch right? Catch as can, yeah. Where you didn't try to hurt anybody. You were just moving so quick around them that you... You know, you did what you did, and and he was one of those guys. He was like a the hundred and thirty pound state champ from Roselle, Roselle Park. Park. Yes. Yeah, yeah, and uh, and he was a great guy. I mean, he was not. You know, later on when I coached kids in wrestling, and I was around these other guys that are like you know animals. You know, they're <laughs> they're they're living vicariously through their kids. They're trying to get kids to hurt each other. You know, they they have no compassion for uh, the kids out there that are getting creamed. And Norm was not like that. He was just a really, really gentle guy, and uh, so, so far, like Jerry Satchel, Saxel, very much like that. Kind of subdued, quiet. If I'm know. hearing you correctly, Mark, I think, and I remember meeting Norm a few times. You're you're looking at people that really appreciated just effort. Give yeah. us a good effort. Yeah. Let's let's you know you'll let's see improvement, but. It's the work ethic that yeah. they instilled. Yeah. You know, the every day just keep going back and churning through it and eventually good things will sure. happen, which converts over to your profession and to your professional life. Sure, absolutely. I mean, and you know, I mean, you know, we're both ex wrestlers and everything. And you're never you're not really ever an ex wrestler, you just stop wrestling, right? It's true. The mentality stays with you. This the self hatred that it <laughs> for, forces you into that. It's situation. amazing what you remember. <laughs> yeah, you know, that, whatever it is that insanity that makes you even do it to begin with, that the work ethic, the, the self punishment that you have to go through to be successful in wrestling, you do carry that through. You and do. you know, you do. And you know, 
hard work is self punishment. Yeah. You know, it is. Yeah. It's it's that not rest, easy. That wrestling mentality can be tough on on relationships, as we <laughs> Absolutely. know. Absolutely, but, uh, <laughs> but, but it's, it's gainful in other areas. Anybody else here in, in any other activity, Mark? Growing up, I mean, you mentioned a teacher and the, who obviously made an impact on right. you. Right. A couple activities, a coach. Any other activities that you did? from Summit in those early days that you think helped formulate who you became later Well, on. I got to tell you something that is, I think is really important, and I, I hope that it doesn't go over badly with your audience, but, um, you know, I grew up middle class in an affluent town, and my children have grown up middle class in an affluent town. And the affluent town does two things for you. It, it motivates you to succeed because you are surrounded by people that have succeeded. But the other thing it does is it pulls back the curtain on wealth. You know, you see these lifestyles, but then when you get into the kitchen, you see some of the, some of the, uh, of the uh, frailties and the missteps and the landmines that come with that wealth. And so, it, it, to me, and, and even and for my family, I think, you know, growing up in Summit has, I've been able to balance those two things. You know, succeed at something, but make sure it's something you love. And then make sure that your family is grounded in something that's not just materialistic. And you're going to really appreciate this. So. You know, uh, I, I ride around town in my town and, you know, here. And, you know, you see these, you know, uh, Hondurans or Guatemalans and, you know, cutting the lawn. And I never fail to say to my children, my grandfather did that kind of work. We are not that far removed from those people. And let me tell you, the latter goes two ways, you know. Because you're Mark, not careful, you might be doing that kind of work. Mark Diano, that's the insightful philosophical information that I miss reading <laughs> on Sundays in your I column. It, John. Mark, I got to tell you, part one went way too fast. We're going to come back in just a second, go over part two. We'll talk a little bit about New Jersey. We'll talk about some other influences in your life and some other interests. And uh, we'll continue this free-flowing conversation with Mark Diano. So thank you for joining us in part one. And we look forward to seeing you in part two.